What's going on? Welcome to This is the Real Estate Investing Mastery Podcast. Glad you're here. We're going to be talking about all things land investing, my favorite topic right now. And this is a lady, Alicia Jarrett, who runs a company out of Australia. Her business has exploded. It's taking off. And she's helping a lot of land investors um, succeed in their land investing ventures. And so you're going to be hearing from Alicia on what's working and what's not from other people out there who are doing the stuff. She has the advantage of looking at this business from a 30,000 foot view elevation, right? And one of the things I'm really curious about talking to her is asking her like, you know, it used to be three, four, five years ago, we get tremendous response rates on direct mail. Now it seems like it's not doing as well, but I don't know, we're still doing a lot of deals. So like, what are you seeing that's working well today? Um, if you like to listen in, this is the right place to be. So first things first here, I want to ask you guys, if you are not familiar with the land flipping stuff, if it's new to you and you're like, oh, this is, I don't understand. How is flipping vacant land different, better than houses? I've got a free kit that I put together, simplelandkit.com, where I'm going to give you a ton of free stuff for free. And pretty soon we are going to be charging for this. I've been talking about that for a few months, but we're getting close to launching this as a free, I mean, as a paid thing. But for right now, you can get my direct mail swipe file. You get my seller scripts, my realtor scripts, some of my contracts, um, a calculator software that I use to help analyze deals, and a bunch of other things that I forget at simplelandkit.com. My contracts, did I say that? Checklists, scripts, software, it's all free. Simplelandkit.com. When you go there, it's going to ask you to opt in. After you opt in, you're going to get an invitation to watch a class that I did where I'm going to teach you how to actually use the stuff that's in here, okay? The other thing, too, is if you're listening to me right now in a podcasting world, hello, I'm glad you're here. I've been doing this podcast since 2011. Now, sometimes what I'll do is I'll do videos on YouTube. Not that I've forgotten you guys, my podcast audience. I love you guys, right? <clears throat> I've been doing a lot of podcasts lately from my car, in my from my phone in my car, and I call them REI in your car podcast. So those of you listening to the audio right now, check out my YouTube channel because there's a lot of videos I put out on YouTube that aren't necessary. I can't do as podcasts because there's I'm showing things, right? And also you two on YouTube that are watching this, go check out my audio podcast. It's Real Estate Investing Mastery is the name of the podcast. But on there, you're going to hear things where I'm talking about, for example, we just did a deal and I was talking about it while I was driving on my in my car. Um, I also did a coaching call with a student, and uh, I did a podcast, audio only podcast on that. So wherever you listen to podcasts, Apple, Spotify, does anybody else listen to podcasts anywhere else? I use a pocket uh, an app called Pocket Casts, but just do a search for Joe McCall or Real Estate Investing Mastery to find the podcast there. Cool, and then on the YouTube channel. That's growing like by leaps and bounds. I'm starting to do a lot more content for YouTube. So anyway, if you depend, if you want to listen or if you want to watch, I'm just glad you're here. I really am. And don't forget again, this kit, simplelandkit.com. Check it out and uh, get your hands on it. It's free and it pretty soon won't be. All right. All right. Thank you guys. All right. Alicia, how are you? Joe, it's so good to see you. I'm really well. Thank you. How are you? Doing good. Excellent. You you don't have an American accent. You're obviously from Australia, but you're in Phoenix right now for a few weeks, right? I am. And finally, like you just mentioned before in the intro that we saw each other recently at a mastermind event. And uh, so this is trip number three to the States this year so far. Yeah. Officially, I've spent more than a third of my year in the US and we're about to move here next year. So super excited oh, yeah. about what was to come. Yeah, we are. We've been doing business in the U.S. now, Joe, for eight years. And uh, it's funny when you just said before that your podcast has been going since 2011. First of all, congratulations. That is Thank you. huge. Because you started podcasting before podcasting was really a thing. Well, maybe. But I remember thinking <clears throat> at the time when I started it, oh, man, I missed the boat, right? I, I missed the wave. It's, the, the, it's not going to be as popular as it was before. But I love doing it. It's fun. I think you got the wave at just the right time. And, and I was on one of your podcasts, I think yeah. it was about two or three years ago now. And uh, and I, I had a great conversation with you then. So then when I saw you at the Mastermind, we're like, oh my goodness, hi. Because there's yeah. so many people being the fact that I'm in Australia most of the time. 
there's so many people that I essentially have connected with, but have never met in person. So it's always yeah. great to meet people face to face and and check in. But, um, but I love yes, you're right. I love masterminds for that reason, just to network with people and that are, you know competitors, quote unquote, even right. Like there are a lot of other land guys there and gals <clears throat> that were we were just feeding off of each other and helping each other grow. Um, yeah, now, where in, in the U.S. are you moving to? Oh, that's the million dollar question, Joe. I'm thinking it's going to be San Diego. Um, we actually love Florida, uh, and I uh, was thinking St. Petersburg, Florida, but, um, the last trip that we had to get back to Australia from Florida was 36 hours in total. And I was like, that's a long trip, right? That's a really long trip. Whereas when it's Pacific, Pacific coast, we yeah. just jump on a plane from LA and be home in, you know, 14 hours. So, um, it's pretty easy to get back. So I think it's going to be San Diego at this stage, but I love San Diego. Uh, that's the one. Uh, I do yeah. too. I've been to San Diego a few times. I know a few people there. I love the weather. Um, it, it's got great weather, but not the humidity that Florida has. Better for yeah. us women when it comes it's to very weather. similar to. <laughs> yeah, it's very similar to a lot, a lot of parts of Australia, I'm sure. Yeah, it actually um, is, Joe. Yep. I was uh, raised in San Diego. I was born in LA, raised in San Diego. I'm very familiar with that. But anyway. Um, you have a company called Supercharged Offers. Talk about what you guys do real quick there. We do, we do. So before I jump into Supercharged Offers, it's important for people to know the backstory about why we started Supercharged Offers because we're also, I say we, my business partner, Matt and I, we're also land investors. Um, and we started Supercharged Offers, Joe, about somewhere between four and a half years ago, somewhere around there. And we started it because we were noticing in our own business that we had like five different companies that we had to go to to help us with our business. So we had a data company, a mailing company, um, someone that was managing our, our Facebook page, another one that was managing ads for us, a cold calling company. It was just, it was all over the place. And we just noticed in our own business, the fact that, that we both come from corporate backgrounds and managing things a lot more efficiently. We just thought, surely there's got to be a company out there that all five of these are in one. We couldn't find one. So we started well, our What own. were the five things? <laughs> so the five things that we had was, uh, so we had to go to one place for our data, another place for our direct mail, another place for our digital marketing. So our website, we had a different person that was running ads for us on Google and we had a different company that was doing um, cold calling for us. Okay. Five. Yeah. It's a lot. So we... That is a lot. That is a lot. And what we also noticed, though, is that was creating some inefficiencies in our business because if one of those five wasn't working properly or we weren't on top of things, we would go a month or two without mailing. We would oh, yeah. miss opportunities and cycles. And, and our business just felt like it was on this roller coaster. Whereas now that we have implemented supercharged offers, which we use for our own stuff, it's all about how we help real estate investors to be more consistent to have everything in the one place that worked together um, and to have one team that they have to liaise with and not a whole bunch of different businesses um, and to have like a fractional marketing team that can help them out with all the aspects of, of running a land business. Because as you and I know, Joe, people make money when they're on the phone with sellers and buyers doing deals. That's where you make money. But all this other 100%. stuff that people need to do in their businesses they can outsource to us and we can do it all for them, which is really cool. So we love working with land people because it's where we've really dominated the space and um, we know what works. Yeah. Yeah. That's really good because, um, well, well, are you mainly helping people in land or are you also helping people with houses or both? We're doing all of it, but I would just say out of natural attraction, because I'm in a lot of the land groups and land space, about 80% of our customers are land. Um, but we have people that do single fam. Uh, small multifamily, um, RV parks. We've also got a couple of other customers doing self-storage. So we we have the data and the processes and the systems to be able to do acquisitions, marketing for any kind of real estate investor. Okay. But you you prefer, what you're really good at, your sweet spot is vacant land. It is. Yeah. yeah. Love vacant land. Um, okay. So how many clients are you working with right now? Approximately, round numbers, if you don't mind. Yeah, we've got just over 220 customers in nine countries that are all doing deals in the US. Um, we tend to also attract a lot of people from overseas because I guess they look at me and go, 
Well, they're doing land from Australia. So we've got customers all across Europe, Asia, um, that are all doing big business in the US. And because of that connection where we're starting to really launch that out a little bit as well, which for me is super exciting because that that boundary that people have in their heads, which is, no, I couldn't possibly do land in another state. Well, there's people doing this from the other side of the world. So yes, you can do land anywhere. Um, I just interviewed and I'm a guy. Actually... I just interviewed a guy who's done 300 deals from Germany. Was that Robin? Yeah. So Robin's a really close friend of mine. Um, I know Robin and his wife really well. They are awesome. He's actually a customer of ours. So um, yeah, we helped him set up his business from Germany. Um, all right. So he's now one part of the first... mastermind. So you're seeing him in person too. Nice. <laughs> Nice. Um, one of the things I was thinking about was you were talking like, okay, you've got 200 and something competitors that are you're doing marketing for. And, and one of the things that I really wanted to spend some time talking about is it seems like you hear these investors complaining about how much more competitive land investing is getting, which by the way, I've been hearing that complaint from house investors and land investors since I got started in 2006. Yeah. I remember- you're in Phoenix right now. And I remember people, because I was learning how to do wholesaling houses from people that were teaching it in Phoenix <clears throat> back then. And I had a friend who was getting involved. And I remember, <clears throat> sorry, I remember hearing from these people complaining about how competitive it was back in 2006. And they, the joke was you couldn't walk down Phoenix without tripping over bandit signs because there was just so many wholesalers going out there and doing deals. Well, then, of course, the market crashed. Yeah. Right. The market crashed, and you would think, well, okay, people would stop complaining about competition because there are no, everybody's out of the business. No, <clears throat> there were still a lot of wholesalers doing deals. Um, yep. And, and they were, if they weren't complaining about finding sellers, they were complaining about finding buyers. So I, I'm kind yeah, of doing some content. about anything, white they, Jerry? <laughs> yeah, for sure. So let's, let's to that because I think there's a myth versus fact element here. Would you agree? There's say it again. A myth versus fact element. Oh yeah. Yeah. Talk about so that. So here's the myth. The myth is the land is too competitive. Well, compared to what would be the question I'd ask people because if you're in the single family space, it is like still five, six times more competitive than the vacant land space. Vacant land is nowhere near saturated yet. Single fam, yeah, it's saturated in some areas. Is vacant land starting to get competitive? Yes, it is. But is there also a huge amount of people dropping off? Yes, there is. And I know that, and you see this in the groups too, you get people that they sign up to um, some training, so some education, they might do one or two mailers, and because they don't get a deal, they drop off because they go, oh, this doesn't work. Which is, so, yeah. now, if I were to guess, Alicia, I would guess 80, that, that's 75, 85% yep. of people yep, exactly. quit after the first couple months. Yep. Yep, but here's the reality. So myth versus fact. The fact is it does take a good six months of ramp up time to get a, a vacant land business going. Now, month one, you're in setup mode. Month two to three, you're starting marketing and you've got to keep that marketing going. Months four and five, you're starting to get properties under contract, but you're probably not going to sell those until month, say, six or seven to start to recycle that money back in and keep going. So I think a lot of people have this get rich quick thing in their mind that, a land business, they're gonna they're gonna land a unicorn overnight, and next month they're gonna be making six, six figures. That's actually just totally false, and it really annoys me when I see some of the educators out there that that, that espouse that because it's the reality is it does take hard work, and you do need to keep at it. You do need to have a runway of a good couple of months to to have your marketing in play and keep it going. It's the ones that aren't consistent that tend to not see the the results that they want. Right. So the second thing about oversaturation and when it comes to you I, I want to come back to what you said before about essentially we're working with just over 200 competitors the thing is we're not really because not all of them are active at the same time um, so if I was to look out of those 200 how many of them are more people that do this the full-time business as opposed to ones that are just hobbyists that might do a, a deal here and there I would say less than 50 percent of those are full-time people so that's not huge the U.S. has 350 million people in it. If I'm only dealing with 100 people, it's not math. <laughs> yeah. Well, and here's the other interesting thing. Like some of these counties that are competitive, <clears throat> you can go and pull a list of 30, 40,000 
vacant landowners in that one county, that one county, county, right? Yep. And do you think that even the most active investors, I would guess probably the, the majority of your active investors, Alicia, are sending maybe a thousand postcards or a thousand letters a week. Is that about right? Maybe more? Yeah. The average is about four to 5,000 a month, correct? And here's the other thing with that thirty to 40,000 um, list of landowners, right? We might have two or three customers in the same area, like might be the same county or, or similar counties around it. But first customer, and we're always monitoring this, by the way, so we do get that 30,000 foot view, so we try and keep it nice and fair. But first customer, their strategy is infill lot. They're only doing 0.1 of an acre up to one acre. And they've got specific zip codes that they're going after because they want to build. They've got builders and developers um, on their buyers list as part of their strategy. Second customer is doing small acreage. They want properties that they can do a minor subdivision. So they're doing like one acre up to five acres and they want to have those lots that they can just do a split it into two, sell two parcels. That's their strategy. Person number three wants to do four deals a year. They want them to be six-figure deals and they only want to work on bigger acreage that they can do big subdivisions and entitlements on. So there we go with three customers in the same county all with three different strategies. Now, are they marketing to the same people? No. The data is totally different. Even within that data, let's just say that we've got two customers that are focused on infill lot, but one of the customers wants to go after people that have owned their properties for more than five years and they're in a trust or they've got it as a quick claim deed because their area of expertise is dealing with probate. Customer number two just wants everybody that's owned properties that have had it for more than two years. So even there in that minutia of data, you're dealing with different lists. And not everybody is mailing the same list at the same time, right? Exactly, Joe. They're really not. And guess, are there some popular areas? Sure, there are. Um, But this is where doing your research before you go into an area is vitally important. And I think that's probably in the, the toolkit that you're giving away, right? Go and do your research. What's the buyer and seller activity? On the buyer activity, are people buying below market? You know, is there a whole bunch of wholesalers in there that you don't want to be in there? But go and do some more digging and some more research these days. Um, And if you're finding that a market's too hot, doesn't mean there's no deals in there, but maybe switch it off and choose another market in the short term and go back to it later. Well, here's the other thing too, is that that market, you may be, you may have to offer more than you normally do, but you can sell it for higher than you normally do as well, right? And um, you can sell them faster. I I kind of, I started off, my journey was more, I want to do rural recreational land. I didn't want to develop or anything either. I didn't want to subdivide entitlements. I just wanted to get cheap, rural, vacant land and sell it to somebody who wants to throw a camper out there or do camping or something like that. No. And then I started interviewing some guys that were doing a lot of these small infill lots in the middle of these suburban areas in Florida. Yeah, and they're like, man, it's so much easier. And I was watching them do it, and they're showing me what they're doing. I was like, wow, that is pretty cool, because there's so much demand. So there's a lot of advantages to either strategy. Would you agree? Like, if you do recreational land way out in the in the hills, they're easier to sell, maybe because there's less restrictions. You can get bigger lots, less restrictions, but there's also fewer buyers out there. But the little infill lots, there's a ton of money moving into those markets, yeah, and a lot of people wanting to buy land there. So you might have to pay more, you may have more competition, but you can sell them so much faster. And it's a lot easier to comp those things too, right? It really is much easier to comp and also to look at recent buyers in the area. But I'm with you, like these days, I think, you know, we're not in the middle of 2021 where deals were just flying left, right and center and, and it was great. Everyone was celebrating that, right? We're not in that cycle anymore. We're out of that cycle and the cycle's going, you know, down to the bottom end as it does. People who are surprised about that shouldn't be because real estate always goes in cycles. We know this. But um, I think sometimes as well, not being greedy with the deal. So if if a good deal, if you can get it first 60 cents on the dollar and still sell it at 85, 90 cents on the dollar and it's a good deal and it's going to yield you 30 or $40,000 profit, that's still a great deal. You know, if everybody wins, if the buyer wins, the seller wins and you win, it's a good deal. Yeah. The other thing I'm thinking about too is I always com- say compared to what, yeah, the land is compared to what, right? Compared, compared to what, to what? 
you 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 think that one percent response rate for direct mail is bad. Maybe it's not as good as it used to be, but when you compare it to houses, when these land these house investors, they're happy to get one quarter of one percent response rate. We're getting one percent for three four times better. Correct. I agree. Like our, most of our customers at the moment, the average is they're getting one deal per every three to three and a half thousand mailers. Some are actually getting better than that in some areas that are less competitive. But single family home space, you're looking at one deal for every five to six thousand mailers. And again, really need to narrow down your strategy in both of those. Uh, I guess yeah. the other thing, let's talk about response rates for a second if we can. Joe, would that be okay? Sure. Yeah. I think the other thing at the moment with direct mail, um, and this is where we're a little different because we're not just going to send out the same mail piece that everyone else is using because then you're going to look and sound like everyone. And I've heard this in many of the groups that I'm in too, that, that people say, I spoke to my seller, they got 12 letters this week and they were all the same. It's like, well, what are you doing to stand out? So when we're working with our customers, we're really crafting a mail strategy that's going to be different to everything else. So first of all, what is their strategy? So coming back to those examples I said before, what is that strategy? How do we let the data determine what direct mail piece we send? So if you're going to go after big properties that you could subdivide, you're not going to send them the same letter that you're going to send to someone who's got an infula. It just doesn't make sense. So crafting the right letter and the right message to the right market is also important. But then making sure that your mailing strategy is at least two or three touch points. So it's not just send one letter and hope for the best. Maybe it's letter number one talks about these things. In three or, or in two months time, letter number two talks about these things. Two months after that, postcard, which is mail piece number three, talks about these things. Yeah. So there's a whole range of things that you can do to stand out and be seen. And a lot of people are just sending the same stuff and going, this isn't working anymore. I'm like, well, maybe we need to change that up, folks. So what, what are you seeing as some average response rates? Yeah, like our average response rates are still sitting at about the the one percent. Um, again, we have those more competitive counties that are sitting between the half to one percent, and we have less competitive counties that are sitting above one percent. You know, up to one point five, one point six. So that's still pretty good. But I always say to people these days as well, depending upon their KPIs and what they're measuring. So yes, response rate is important, but more than response rate is deal flow. So out of those responses, are they yielding you the right deal? Because if you're only getting 10 responses, but those 10 responses are awesome, and that gets you three deals that are $20,000 each, that's a good mailing. <laughs> so I'd, I'd also encourage people to really think about what they're measuring, because the responses have changed. So let's now go for quality rather than quantity, because I'd r rather work on a small amount of really awesome deals um, than a large amount of deals that aren't that great. Double the work, <clears throat> less deal. Totally agree. So one of the things we're seeing a lot of success with, even in our competitive markets, for us personally, is we're sending out um, range postcards right now where we say, we might be able to offer you between here and here if you're interested, call. Yeah. But even more importantly than that, we're actually now talking to them. When they call in, we either call them back right away or answer the phones loud. Oh. And, and we talk to, to them first. Well, here's where we've gone. To, my philosophy has always been kind of send. A, I, I prefer neutral letters and postcards, and I want to ask you about that in a minute. I yeah. just want to get as many calls as I can. And what I used to do with my two teenagers is the voicemail would come in. We would just send them an offer, and we would talk to about you know we talk to them after they got our offer. Um, and so that worked. We were averaging one out of every thirty offers get accepted. Now what we're finding is when we talk to them first before we send the offer, we're averaging one out of every 15 to 20 offers get accepted. Just because we talk to them a little bit first, build a little rapport, find out if it's a deal we're even interested in. So we're not sending as many offers, but we're getting more of them accepted. Does that make sense? I love it. It totally does. If, you, if we, you know, you and I know Brent Daniels, teaching people, yeah. talk to people. Um, one thing you will hear me say a lot to our customers is it's relationship before real estate. Or another way to put it is it's people before properties. Like these days, as well, the word wholesale tends to have a bit of a negative connotation now. Would you agree, Joe? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Depending on who you ask. Are, correct. Uh, correct. But a lot of us are not wholesaling per se. We're, we're buying properties. We're doing different things with them. However, to the average property owner out there, the average seller, who's still getting targeted to sell their property direct to a buyer, 
they they've been overrun with this uh, for a long time and maybe a lot of those sellers have been burnt by people that have got them under contract haven't closed on that contract didn't do the right thing by the seller and now they've got a bit of a bad taste in their mouth so the gone are the days I'm, I'm that's why i said hallelujah when you said that because i think gone are the days that you can push someone to a voicemail and not speak to them and still think you're going to get a deal people will now give preference to people that they feel they can trust and that they have a relationship with the only way that that's going to happen is to get on the phone there's so many things too to that like you could ask them do you have any other properties you talk to them you get to know them a little bit find out what their situation is right and many times, you know, we tell them, we, if, if you want full price, we can't, we're not your guy, but we might be able to refer some realtors to you. Just yeah. the fact that you say, we want you to sell this property for the highest price possible, if that's what you want, right? So here are some realtors that can probably help you. Just the fact that we can say that to them increases their trust. And they may call some realtors and then realize, I don't want to go through that hassle. So yeah, will you just buy it from me, right? You got it's it. really Jerry. important. All about relationship. Yeah relationship and then follow up. I think if people get that, they can, it, competition almost becomes irrelevant because even in a yeah. competitive market, you can still do more deals, bigger deals by just talking to people, by doing more follow up, um, being, <clears throat> sending better offers, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I wanted to ask you about, about follow up. Oh, so go can ahead. Can we chat about follow up for a sec? Because I think that's yeah. a really important point. Because yeah. again, what I see the difference between our really successful customers and our, our customers that are not as successful, it's in the follow-up. So when a lead comes through, getting on the phone to them that day, like even if you haven't got an offer ready, just introducing yourself. Hey, thank you so much for contacting us about your property. Let's ask some basic info, right? Let, let's go to, get to that. Yeah. Now, if you send an offer or talk about an offer and they decline, like they want retail, put them into a drip sequence. Now, that doesn't have to be a formal drip sequence, but what you should still be doing is you know that they want to sell. You've had a chance to talk to them. Now it's just a case of landing on the right price and the right time. So we've had people like I've got someone that I've been in touch with for 10 months. So every couple of weeks, I either send them a little email or a quick phone call or a quick SMS. Hey, it's AJ here. Just keeping in touch just to see how you're going. Yeah. That's it. It's not a sales call. It's not a tell me what's going on with your property. It's every now and then I might mention the property, but it's a relationship call. It's letting them know I'm still here. Now, this deal that we're about to close with this person, it's a seven-figure deal. So I'm going to work for 10 months to get that, right? But even if it was a $20,000 deal, I'd still get my team to reach out and touch base and keep the lines of communication open because you just never know when it's the right time or the right price for that person. I think... There's a there's a real important part component um, in your follow up with direct mail as well, and yeah. um, one of the things that we did a we did a study, this was for houses, but this is about three years ago. We looked at of the 58 deals that we did that year, only four of them came from that initial contact with the seller. If we wouldn't have done any follow up, we would have only done four deals that year. On average, the follow up was three months, seven to eight touches, but. Um, that follow-up is important. So one of the things I like to encourage people to do is don't just send one offer and then forget it. Send the offer yeah. again a month later. Send the yeah. offer again a month after that. After that, send them another postcard. Or send them another letter. Call them, email them, text them, leave them a voicemail. Keep that follow-up going until they die or they sell their property. Huh. That's how you do deals, right? Yep. Yep. And if you keep doing that when everyone else out there who's a hobbyist is not doing that, well, guess what? you're going to be the one that they call. Um, so I guess the question that people always need to be asking themselves is what am I willing to do over and above what the masses out there are doing to be able to stand out, right? Um, and you mentioned seven to 13 touch points. So the good thing with working with supercharged offers is not only are we doing direct mail, but we're also doing cold calling. We're running ads on Google and Facebook. We're retargeting. So we're doing a whole combination of things to keep you in front of your sellers. And within our campaigns, we often have people that do exactly as you described. They'll do a two or a three touch process in a six month period. Um, and it does yield results, that's for sure. Excellent. All right. So I wanted to ask you about blind offers or neutral letters. Um, what yep. are you seeing most investors doing today? Are they still, is a lot <laughs> of them still doing neutral or blind offers? Yeah, a lot of them. Look, we've got customers that are doing both, but here's what I find that's working best at the moment. Now, we're doing this recording in November 2023. Market is going down. 
things are not looking great out there for a lot of people. But just like after 2008, there's always sellers and there's always buyers in every market, right? So don't don't listen to the media, folks. The, the hype is there, but things will still get transacted. So, but the thing is at the moment is a lot of sellers are holding on for higher prices, even though they can see in the media that the prices are doing this, but they're, they're holding on. So what we're finding that works best at the moment is actually a bit of a combination, Joe, and it's a blank offer. So we're sending out a cover page um, that has got some negotiation points on it that says, hey, Joe, we can see you've got some properties, et cetera. Um, we we want to make a fair cash offer to you. and We're direct, direct to buyer, direct to seller. Uh, but we want to know what your fair cash price would be based upon the following items. And then we've got things like, is it cleared? Is it not cleared? Does it have a slope? Are there back taxes? Is there anyone else on the title? Is there a probate needed? Like, What's all these things that we're going to have to sort out for you? And then uh, the second page is a contract. It's blank. And it actually says, based upon the the terms in the, the cover letter, put in what you feel you're, you would be willing to sell your property for for cash and a quick closing. Now, the whole idea around that, are you going to get some crazy offers? Yes, but you do that when you do blind offers anyway. You do it in any other letter, right? But the whole thing about it is you're going to know where they're at, but on the bottom, they're going to give you their, they're going to opt in. They're going to give you the name, phone number, email, and they're going to sign it. Now you've got a negotiation strategy. Hey, Joe, so this is how the conversation will go. Hey, Joe, got got your signed contract back. That awesome that you want, 50000 I've run some numbers. The most I can give is 32.5. Do we have a deal? That's awesome. Now it becomes a negotiation strategy, right? And and it's all about how can I get people on the phone to start that process? I think the other thing, you know, I said before about myths versus facts. I have a lot of people that come to us and say, I want to do blind offers because it's quicker. That's a myth. It's not quicker. There's a lot more data to do up front. And even if you're doing your numbers on mass, which we do for our customers, the minute you get a lead through that has signed a blind offer contract, you've still got to check your numbers, run your comps, verify it, and perhaps negotiate. So it doesn't circumnavigate it. I think that the people think that it does, but no, it doesn't. You've still got to do the same amount of work. What it might do is pre-qualify your leads a little more, but um, but the same amount of work still has to happen, right? No matter yeah. what deal comes through or how it gets to you, you've still got to do those that due diligence, that comps, that negotiation process. Um, so yeah, myth versus fact, they're another one. <laughs> the blank really offer is working great in the current market. That okay. blank offers is, it's interesting. I've never heard of that before. Now, are you, can they fill that out and then mail it back? Or are you telling them to go to a website to fill out the information or what are you doing there? Right, it's a two um, they can fill out the second page, mail it back. It's got a complimentary envelope in it. All they need to do is pop a stamp on it, or they can click the QR code that's on the contract takes them straight to the websites that we develop where they can fill in all their details and put a counter offer. There's a section that we put on all the websites to formalize an offer. Um, and then that goes straight into our customer's CRM. So they can do it a number of ways. Um, and definitely, you know, we're seeing a lot more stuff happen on websites now more than ever. So one of the big things that we work with our customers on is things like branding and customer experience. Customer experience being how easy are you making it for your prospects to do business with you? And if you're making it difficult because you only want to do business one way, you're leaving money on the table. I've wrestled with that for years. Like, because I want their phone number. I believe so strongly in getting on the phone. I've, I've always said, if you're yeah. not on the phone, you're not making money. This, this is the million dollar skill right here. So I've always been afraid with giving them a website to go to because that would then remove any excuse or or they say, oh, I don't have to call him now. So I'll just go to his website. And they may not like my website. They may think it's ugly. The colors are weird. My, the picture, my picture is weird. Or especially since my name is kind of out already known there, they might Google my name, Joel McCall, and realize, oh, that's some evil guru. So like, <laughs> I would rather them just call. So I've been saying on my postcards and letters for years, just text or call our 24 hour recorded voicemail. Yep. And I only give them one choice and that's to call. Um, I don't know, man. Have, 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 have you tested that? Do you agree that yeah. maybe I'm not, I'm like, maybe I am losing some sellers? I would think that you are and here's why. So let's put ourselves in our customer's shoes for a moment, our seller's shoes. We now have sellers across all demographics. They are in their 80s and 90s that are sitting on intergenerational land. 
and they're even down in their 20s and 30s, the people that have inherited properties or maybe they bought a property to build a house on and now they're divorced. Like we have people across all, all spectrums. Now I'm, I'm in my late 40s. I am the kind of person that would respond to an ad or something digitally because that's how I operate. My parents are the kind of people that would respond to a direct mail piece where they can have a conversation with someone. So we need to create an environment that no matter who we're marketing to, whether they're 20, whether they're 90, whether they're digital nomads or they're phone people or they're, they're email people, we need to create an environment that makes it easy for them to choose how they want to interact with us. And then if you think about communication 101, we need to then respond in kind. So if you've got someone whose preference is SMS or email, that should be your main communication method with them. And ask them, like even on your scripting, hey, w- what do you prefer? Do you prefer to keep in touch on email or are you more of a phone person? They'll tell you and then, you know, note that. <laughs> so I have, you tested, very- though, have you tested a postcard, let's say, that says go to this website or call or text this number? What gets you more leads? Oh, that is a million dollar question because it's so hard to test unless you're testing the same people in the same market with the same list. So to that degree, no, I haven't done a test of that in detail. But do we then look at response rates on, because our, our portal will track how many people are going to your website, how many people are clicking on a QR code, how many people are calling you. So we're always looking at those three mediums, like where are the leads coming in from? Yeah. And interestingly enough, it's about 50-50. Oh, huh. yeah. The other thing I want people to think about as, as I say this, we do due diligence on properties. Your sellers are doing due diligence on you, especially if they've been burned by people in the past. They now want to know who they're doing business with. And we can see that because every time we send out a bunch of direct mail, we can see the website visits go up quite dramatically. And then they start to, you know, even off a little bit. And then they go up. You're, you're giving them the website on the letter, right? Correct. On the letter, so the obvious, they can click to as well. Yeah. I'd have to yeah. test it more. I, I yeah. just, I want their phone numbers, right? I don't want to give them options. So they can text me or call me. Yep. But um, the other thing too, Joe, just to come back to what you said about, you don't want them to land on your page and see you and maybe get confused about that, right? There's nothing to stop you building your website. We've got a lot of customers that don't want their face anywhere on their business or their name. So we built it around their brand. Like what's their value proposition? How do they help? What are the different solutions that they're offering sellers? Like if a seller has a probate or a title issue or something that they're going to need help with, what are our sellers offering them to ease them into the fact that they're the right place to go? Uh, And it doesn't have to be personalized. I will say though that our websites that that we do make that are personalized, that have people and profiles and, you know, different things on them, it, it does make a difference. You know, people yeah. have even called some of our customers and said, hey, I went to your website and I really loved what I saw and I loved that you had your Christian values on there. I want to do business with you. So I guess at the end of the day, the message here for people to take away is we are not our prospects. Our prospects are our prospects. So we need to create an environment that ensures that we're taking all objections off the table for them. Yeah, I get it. Okay. Um Let's talk like about you, Joe. <laughs> no, no, because like here, here's an example on a little different related topic. So I create yep. videos to sell things to people, right? Uh, <clears throat> I'll have a, a like I tested this before. I had a ninety-seven dollar product I was selling, teaching people how to um, do lease options virtually. Okay, and. Um, you and I know when you're at a sales page, it's annoying when the, when when there's a video playing and they hide all the controls. All you can do is hit play and pause, right? Annoying. And then they hide the button below, the call to action. They hide all that information. So they force you to watch this video before they even tell you what the price is, before they show you any information about it. And they don't let you fast forward or slow down the video, right? So annoying to no end. But I've tested this many times where I hide the controls, I hide the information, and I only show that button pops up at minute 45 or, you know, three quarters of the way through it. Yep. Um, Every single time I do way better 
doing the more annoying things. In other words, my sales will be much higher. Opt-ins, I'm talking double, triple better. A lot of people get annoyed and mad. You're, you know, you're just, I would never watch a 30 minute video. I would never watch an hour and a half long webinar. <laughs> but I've tested the same thing on a short 30 minute webinar and an hour and a half webinar. The hour and a half webinar always does better. I've tested it with, you know what I'm saying? Those kinds of things. And so yeah. sometimes we, we want to be where our prospect is, but at the same time, we, you know, we have to like, we can't be afraid to force them to do something because we think they may, we wouldn't like it. Does that make yeah. sense? It does. Yeah, yeah, it does. I, I think we just have to yeah. test it. Yeah, you do. And and the only way to test it is to do something that you're currently not doing and, and monitor results, right? And as I said before, yeah. people, so many people I know don't even really think about their KPIs. Like, you know, I, I, I am on regular calls with our customers where I'm always asking, what's your response rate? What's your conversion rate? How many are you nurturing? I'm still surprised at how many people don't know that. Um, and, yeah, and should that's you, so, you know, knowing your numbers and, uh, and I'm guilty of that myself, you know, sometimes I don't know all the numbers, but it's, it's got to make it your business to be across it. Right. So it's interesting. Okay. I want to ask you questions about, um, what are you seeing now as the best markets in the country to do land deals in? Ooh, that's you don't have to get specific down to the state or county if you want, but maybe regions or. Yeah, look, I mean, there's still, you know, the, the Midwest is still um, pretty awesome, but uh, we're getting a lot of customers having some success in, um, so down like North Carolina, South Carolina, New Mexico, um, Mississippi, Tennessee, there's some great stuff there. But I also see some of our customers are now doing more in the north side of the country because, you know, we're heading into winter. Now's a good time to get properties under contract cheaper and then sell them in the springtime. So there's, there's pros and cons to both. Believe it or not, you know, two of our really successful customers at the moment, one's doing Hawaii, one's doing Alaska. They wouldn't be places mm-hmm. I would have thought about, but they've got great results. Wow. Do they do they live out there or they're just... Nope. Oh, one, the one that does Hawaii lives in Hawaii. The one that does Alaska um, lives in Texas. <laughs> wow. I, yeah. I've always, I would love to do deals in Montana and Utah. But there's just, I always, I'm nervous about that because there's just seems like there's nothing that, there's no activity going on there. It would be hard to get mm-hmm. comps and hard to find realtors. It's limiting beliefs of mine. Yeah. Always worth doing that market research, right? To see what, what possible. Okay. Um, talk about lists. Um, what kind of lists do you like to pull? And do you have any favorite uh, data providers or do you just get that yourself? Yeah. So we, um, with Supercharged Offers, we're actually really lucky because we've got a data warehouse that has every single property in the US in it, all of the owner attributes, MLS records, it's got everything. So we can actually get really creative with data. So we use our own data, which is yep. awesome. Um, and we're able to go into the data warehouse and query it in there. So we can pull anything. Um, and I think what's really great about that is customers will often come to us with these crazy strategies. Like we did have a customer the other week that's like, I really want to focus on probate deals. So I want to know in these five states, anybody that transacted their property on a quick claim deed or a hundred dollar transfer. We're like, cool, we can do that. Um, we have customers that come to us and say, I want to do a multi-property strategy. I've got a mailer that's going to go out to people that have between one and five properties and a different mailer that goes out to people between five and 10. Cool. We can do that. So we can pretty much do anything, which is pretty exciting because a lot of customers now are getting more creative with what they want to do. Gems are my favorite list, honestly. I I like sticking with the tried and tested, which is don't over scrub. I think a lot of people uh, these days are over scrubbing to the point that they're they're leaving money on the table. Because if I look at one of our biggest deals to date, our biggest deal to date um, where we made just over two hundred and fifty thousand, it was um, landlocked. It was. It had wetlands on it, but the wetlands, there was no protected species or wildlife or, or flora or fauna. And the wetlands, it wasn't wet underfoot. There was just a water table that, that had a certain areas that were a bit damp. Um, so when we got the, the survey done and the delineation report, we knew that it could be mitigated and there was properties next door that had already been mitigated and it was residential, but it also had a, a future designation of commercial. It was the best deal we've ever done. Now, if we had over scrubbed our data because it didn't have access and did have a right of way that, that and did have an easement on the title. Um, 
first first glance, we would have probably gone not a deal, but it was an awesome deal. So I think sometimes when we pull lists for our own stuff, we're just really looking at what are the tried and tested things. So, you know, people that have owned the properties for more than three years haven't done anything. They're individuals, churches, trusts, take out the corporations, government owned. Um, we love making sure that it's got agricultural land in there because in a lot of counties, agricultural land is multi-zoned. You can use it for a number of things. So, so well, your- sorry, let me rewind a little bit. Do you do you remove out <clears throat> LLCs? We typically don't, but a lot of our customers like it if we do so for our customers, yeah. But um, we often leave LLCs in because we've done yeah. some really good deals with LLCs over the years. Yeah, I do too. Yeah. I do too. Yeah. Um, so the- you have a... I was going to ask you another question, but if you're not finished, go ahead. No, no, I was just going to say, I guess coming back to your question, which is what's my favorite list is a list that, that works and don't don't over scrub. The only filters I do are, um, they bought it over five to 10 years ago. That depends if I want a bigger list or not. And they don't live in that county. Yep, That's the out of county. Yeah. yeah, perfect. Perfect. You really don't need much more than that. And, and maybe I'm leaving a lot of deals on the table of people that do live in that county. I don't know. Well, you, um, could easily, like, we, you could easily mail to them afterwards and then go, you know, you could have a separate mailer, one that is, we see that you don't live anywhere near your property, that you're in another county. Um, maybe you don't visit it very often, so let's have a talk about what your plans are. Versus someone that lives in county, which is, we see that you've got a property that might be close to where you live, but you've never used it. So can we have a conversation about what your plans are and maybe you'd prefer the cash instead. So again, market message match, right? Let the data tell you what you might be marketing to that person. Yeah, that's good. Okay, I want to ask you about CRMs. Okay. Um, what, are, what are some of your favorite CRMs that you see out there? Uh, my favorite one would have to be Pebble. Um, I just love what Jesse and Kevin have done with creating, and, and they've still got so much on there their to-do list that they, they keep adding to Pebble. But Pebble for me is a great way because it manages both your sellers and your buyers. There's a lot of CRMs out there I see that are good at managing seller pipelines but not buyer pipelines or vice versa. Um, but theirs seems to manage both. And I love that it, they've centralized all of their communications now into one. So all your calls, emails, SMS, et cetera, it's all in the one communication thread, which makes it super easy. Um, nice. So yeah, I, lo- I love those guys. I think they're doing a great job. And is it working? Right, the the texting and the outbound inbound calling. I know there were some issues with TCPA or whatever. Um, have they been able to clear those hurdles and and still keep all those communications there? Yeah, look, I think so. I haven't heard any different, but definitely, um, you know, using the platform to be able to call from and to. I know that that's working really well. TCPA is in everyone's corner at the moment. I think kind of being this little angry gremlin in the corner. Uh, you know, I know people that are using launch control that have had it shut down. I know people using REI reply that have had it shut down. So, you know, we're finding a lot of people coming back to us to help them out with cold calling and direct mail at the moment, because those two things, they still work and they're still part of the tried and tested, right? So, (laughs) yeah. All right. So you talked about direct uh, cold calling. Talk about that a little bit. Do you actually do the cold calling yourself? Or do you help them find and hire, train cold callers? No, we, we've got a relationship with a team that they're all American-based cold callers. Um, so we don't go offshore. We've got the scripts that we know that works. We skip trace the data for them. We get the cold calling done. We just make sure on a daily basis those leads are getting emailed through to our customer. And their job is to then get on the phone to those leads straight away, nurture them, um, make an offer, build that relationship. Okay. Could you What, what advice would you give to people that want to stand out above the competition. We've been talking a lot about that, right? Like they're comp- they're concerned with competition. They're concerned about picking, going into a market that already has a lot of activity in there. But what can people do to stand above their competition? Yeah, I think what they can do to stand above is make sure that they do have an omni-channel presence. Um, and that's what we're about. So if you're just doing one channel of marketing, so if you're just doing SMS or you're just doing direct mail, think about it in a combination. So what would your marketing look like if you had a multi-touch mail piece, if you had ads running on Google and Facebook, if you had a Facebook page, uh, sorry, a, a website that was highly converting and highly nurturing, if you had email automation set up every time someone went to your website and submitted some details, um, if you were doing cold calling for your more expensive deals, like what what's it going to look like for you if you had like 
five channels going rather than just one because that's a way to stand out. The other way to stand out is also by looking at your online marketing. So coming back to what we were saying before about websites and socials, now, I think people, they often just will pay for a templated page that is basic. There's no SEO on it. There's nothing special about it. It can scare people off. Um, really thinking about what's your online presence and what do you want to be putting out to the world that is going to nurture your lead to go, oh, I've landed in the right place and I need to speak to these people. And that's all about content, content, creation, development, you know, building something that's going to make you stand out as well. Um, and branding. I think it's important for people to think about their business as a business um, and really think about what they want the world to be seeing. So you do a lot of stuff for investors. And um, what, what kind of client are you looking to work for? Can you work with the beginner who has a tight budget? Or do you want to, are you trying to help people that mainly have maybe more money in, to invest in their Yeah, that's a great question, Joe. The thing is, we work with people across all of that spectrum. So if you've just done your education and you're now looking at getting a proof of concept in your first deal, we've got services that can just do your data and mailings to get you started, right? Let's get you out of the overwhelm of trying to do it all yourself. Work with us. We'll get, get those, those mailers out, get that phone ringing all the way up to people that are seasoned investors that need a, a rebrand, a relaunch. They want to outsource to a marketing team and get their VAs focused on something else. So they'll often come to us and say, look, I want to do 10,000 mailers a month. Um, I want you to relaunch my online present here. You guys take everything. So we can do everything in between. And we're, we're actually with our customers for the long journey because you can start off with a small campaign. Then after a few months, you might turn it up a little bit. Then when you get a few more deals, you might turn it up a little bit more. So we, we're with you for the long term, which I think is wonderful. We become quite good friends with our customers, which I love. Good. Excellent. Um, advice for beginners. You know, 95% of people listening to this, they're interested in land. They've never done a land deal before. What kind of advice would you give them to get started? And maybe they've been a little overwhelmed with all the other <clears throat> options and stuff that we've been talking about here. But yeah. how, how yeah. would you help them? Yeah, first thing I would say is don't get caught up in bright, shiny syndrome. If you've only got a small budget, then do the basics and do them well. So get some data done, get some direct mail sent out and get your phone ringing. Even if you only get a couple of phone calls, it gives you a chance to put your training and your learning into practice. So move away from the overthinking and move into action. And if I can reassure everyone on here, the first mailer that we ever did, like seven or eight years ago now, the first ever mailer we did, we got our phone number wrong. We had a typo. So you are going to make mistakes, but you do recover from them, right? And so get out of the overthinking. Do your basic research on your county buyer and seller activity. Is it a growth path city? Is there infrastructure happening? Like is, is there, what's the job rate there? So do some basic, you know, analysis and yeah, that looks like a good market. Uh, make sure it's a, not a non-disclosure state to start with. I think that just makes life a bit more difficult for you when you're starting out. Um, and then come to us. We'll go pull the data. We'll get the mail sent out and we'll get you started. Uh, Alicia, how can people get a hold of you? Yeah, they can just go to superchargedoffers.com. Um, they can also just go to Supercharged Offers on Facebook and uh, I've got all the links in there as well. Um, and if you want to email me direct, it's just uh, Alicia, which is A-L-I-C-I-A at superchargedoffers.com. And I also want to give you a bit of a, a freebie here as well yeah. sorry, to, to everyone, um, which is a, a Supercharged Offers success scorecard. It gives you an opportunity to you, for you to kind of look at your business and benchmark where you're at and what you need um, to really understand all the different components of how to run your business. So I'll put that, I'll give that to you and you can put that in the show notes as well. Okay, cool. So if people want that, it'll be if you go to realestateinvestingmastery.com and go to this, just do a search for Alicia, A-L-I-C-I-A, and you'll see this scorecard uh, there. Cool? Wonderful. Well, Alicia, thank you so much. Hopefully my computer hasn't crashed here. <laughs> I, can, I, I, I appreciate so it. It was a really good podcast. Yeah, I really love speaking with you today and just um, going over some of those topics that I know we've talked about before, but they're still so important to remind people of. So for anyone listening and tuning in, thank you. And, um, and I hope I can help you on your journey. All right. Thank you so much, Alicia. Superchargedoffers.com. We'll see you guys later. Take care, everybody.
Hey guys, thank you so much for watching these videos. If you like my channel at all, please hit the subscribe button. Get the notification bell thing clicked so you can get notified when new videos come out. Really appreciate it. If you like this video, please give me a thumbs up. Comment down below, all right? Thank you.